Well, thank you for joining us today to discuss what is, in my opinion, the best topic of this conference, impact investing. Um, I'm, my name is Lindsay, as she said. I'm with the Sorensen Impact Foundation. I'm delighted to be here with you all, um, along with my distinguished panelists, to discuss investing in positive change and how family offices have led in this space and continue to inspire a different way of investing. A rather niche market to date, impact investing or investments made with the intention to generate a measurable beneficial social or environmental impact alongside a financial return has seen incredible growth to date. The global impact investing market has doubled in the past year from 114 billion to 228 billion in assets and a younger generation is becoming more interested. As of 2018, 77% of millennials have portfolios that include impact investments, and they continue to seek investments in bonds that have themes associated with impact investing. The forecasted outlook for impact investing is undoubtedly growth. And we are here today with the trailblazers in this space who have committed their careers and lives to promoting and growing the ecosystem from its very inception. So enough for me. Let me turn it to my panelists first. Um, on the very end is Justin Rockefeller, who's chairman and co-founder of The Impact, an organization you'll undoubtedly hear more about throughout this panel. He's also the global director of family offices for Adapar and a member of the investment committee of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. Next to him is my boss and undoubted pioneer in this space, Jim Sorensen. Jim is the founder and president of the Sorensen Impact Foundation. And last but certainly not least, our friend from Panama, Sandro Salsano, who is president of the Salsano Group and chairman of the Salsano Family Office. I'm going to ask each of our guests to kick us off with a bit deeper of a background, um, what, how you've committed your work and life to impact investing. Uh, Justin, let's start with you. Sure. So I essentially am seeking synergy among several hats that I wear. And one is Adapar, which is the financial technology company where I work, which actually powers the data platform for the impact, which is a membership network of impact investors that Jim and I and a number of other impact investors co-founded. And then, um, as was mentioned, I am on the investment committee and previously for nine years the board of a family foundation called Rockefeller Brothers Fund that has been for about uh, five years aligning its mission and its endowment. I've been uh, an impact investor for nearly two decades. And uh, prior to that, uh, was a, a serial entrepreneur. Um, and through the experience uh, in, in business, my early business, I, I had a great success that led me to uh, really understand that you could address social problems in a much more scalable, so self-sustaining way uh, through uh, business and, and innovation. And that led me on the path. And I've since uh, that time um, been advocating for impact investing and uh, working to you know, build the field and, and, intermediary in, and build intermediaries alongside you know, personally uh, doing investing in the space. Uh, on myself, yes. Uh, 10 years ago, I, I was lucky after many failures to uh, sell a company uh, to Goldman Sachs. So I set up my family office. And, uh, and actually, I think that's where we started with my wife uh, also with our foundation. It's called the Salsano Shahani Foundation uh, to uh, invest, uh, to do more impact investing. Uh, uh, and we started in our region, which is Central America. We are based in Panama. Uh, and slowly we are trying to uh, grow uh, also on a global uh, level. Yeah. Thank you. Justin, let's start with you. Uh, your family has certainly played an important role in this sector. In fact, over a decade ago, the Rockefeller Foundation hosted the first convening where the term impact investing was conceived. 
most recently, just as you referred to, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund has been aligning its 1.2 billion endowment with its mission. Uh, I can only imagine how, how fascinating and difficult that can be. Um, Jim and I have been embarking on a similar mission and would love to hear the story of how and why you've embarked on this journey. So Rockefeller Brothers Fund is a private family foundation started in 1940 by my grandfather and um, his, his siblings. And our mission is to advance social change that contributes to a more just, sustainable, and peaceful world. Mm -hmm. And that means that about half of our charitable giving every year goes to addressing and fighting climate change. And so we as an organization are not interested in just maximizing the effectiveness of our program work, right, the charitable giving, but frankly, to maximize the effectiveness of the overall impact that the organization can have. And so we felt it was hypocritical to fight climate change, but then also invest in fossil fuel companies. And about 7% of our uh, endowment was invested directly in fossil fuel companies. And in reflecting, we asked ourselves, well, what are the tools on our tool belt for affecting societal and environmental change? One is um, you know, some expertise, some connections, network. Uh, everyone has time on their tool belt, but obviously capital. And in terms of somewhat unique tools that we had, the surname attached to the foundation has obvious historical ties to the fossil fuel industry. The money for the endowment clearly came from Standard Oil. Um, and its offshoot uh, companies like Amoco and Chevron and Exxon and, and Mobil and, and others. So can we leverage that tool to advance a discussion around mission-aligned investing or specifically divesting of fossil fuels? And so we decided to, to do that, but there were a few interim steps to get there. Uh, the first was that we used an outsourced chief investment office that had us in commingled funds with their other clients. And so structurally, it was actually quite difficult to align our mission and our endowment um, because we didn't, the outsourced CIO had control. Um, and so the first step was actually to take our money and then leave that outsourced CIO and look for a different outsourced CIO um, that would treat us as a separate account so that we had direct control. Over the, over, the, uh, over the endowment. And then in, once we, we did that, we immediately started to divest of fossil fuels. This was in February of 2014, and fortunately, as a financial decision, the timing was good. Oil was about $106 a barrel. Uh, but, but frankly, we did it more for the moral reasons. We felt that owning these stocks uh, and, and yet fighting them with our charitable dollars was somewhat akin to a cancer-fighting foundation investing in tobacco stocks. So uh, we announced this quite publicly, thinking there might be a few headlines around this to draw attention to this question of, of divesting. And ultimately, uh, it became global. And some of the headlines were misleading, a la the whole Rockefeller family divests the fossil fuels, which was not true. This was one family foundation. Um, and we also weren't condemning the fossil fuel industry, but given that we are a separate legal entity and a private foundation whose mission is in part to fight climate change, we felt this was appropriate for us to do. And I'm happy to say five years later, we're very handily beating our, our benchmark, our 70-30 benchmark. Excellent news. Jim, you've been a serial entrepreneur and have used your experience and expertise to invest in promising entrepreneurs in emerging markets like Kenya and India. These invest investments have played an important role in de-risking innovative business models and bringing scale to high-impact products. Can you tell us more about your impact thesis and your own journey of becoming an impact investor? Sure. Uh, as I mentioned in my introduction, I was an entrepreneur, and I think my path to, to impact investing was really uh, dramatically uh, influenced by an experience that I had with probably one of the most successful businesses that I'd founded. This was a business that had originally focused on traditional markets for mass communication through video phones. And 
um, about the time the dot-com bubble burst, uh, those markets all dried up. And I had uh, hired a deaf brother-in-law, uh, primarily because he had difficulty finding a job, but also that in hopes that there might be a market for the products among the deaf. And at that point in time, we made a very dramatic uh, change. We were losing a lot of money. We could close the doors or we could pivot towards uh, this market. And uh, right at that junction, um, a new technology was being uh, trialed in the deaf community to enable the deaf to communicate with the hearing through a, a remote sign language interpreter over the internet in real time. And um, we developed the technology to make this work and uh, uh, it was immediately successful. And this company grew dramatically uh, to where uh, ultimately we sold it less than three years later and it was the largest private e equity transaction done in the state of Utah to that date. But more, more profound in, in that experience was really the impact on the deaf community. And um, you know, I didn't really fully appreciate that until uh, one, of the, one of the deaf referred to really the innovation and, and the work we'd done as, as really the Alexander Graham Bell for the deaf. And it really hit me that we were able to reach a very large population in a relatively short period of time and the reason we were able to do that was because we were able to use private capital and uh, really uh, the, the types of business disciplines that make businesses successful to scale and grow the impact. And that then led me on the way to where uh, I started looking for other models um, and other ways to exercise my, my philanthropy in investing. And through that journey, um, I've made really uh, close to 100 uh, impact investments, uh, either directly or, or through the foundations uh, that I direct. Uh, the foundation makes uh, program-related investments. Those are considered grants, very early stage, uh, very catalytic, high risk uh, to help entrepreneurs become investable. And uh, on the uh, corpus side, you know, we're in the process of moving um, the corpus assets of the foundation to 100% being mission uh, related as Justin has described. And we're about 60% of the way there. Uh, it's been an interesting journey and in the year that uh, it's taken us to do this, uh, we're tracking at about 100 basis points uh, on the positive side as it relates to returns uh, to really demonstrate that you can generate uh, competitive returns by uh, aligning your investments uh, with your values. So that's kind of my journey and it's, it's, uh, it's not to its end. No, just beginning if you ask me. Thank you, Jim. Sandro, Panama is considered one of the most advanced investment markets in Central America. And at this time, there's still great need. You and your wife have set up a foundation that increases access to education. Uh, you have your family office looking at strategic investments. Um, what do you see as the future of impact investing in Central America? And one more follow on to that, what excites you most about the potential mm -hmm. of impact investing to make a change in Central America? Yes, thank you. Uh, we, we are very focused these days in Panama. I don't know how many of you have been there. Um, it's today the fastest growing economy in Central America. We are growing uh, this year 6% uh, GDP-wise. So it dollarized the economy, very modern. Uh, they call it the Singapore or the Caribbean. Um, and so today for us, the cost opportunity also to move uh, in another place in Latin America, especially where you have lots of uh, political instability, uh, you have uh, currency risks, you have uh, countries where we wouldn't like to even visit, like Venezuela, uh, unfortunately. Um, today we see a very compelling story in Panama. Uh, we've been focusing uh, over the last four or five years uh, in the agro-industrial sector. We think it's a very key sector. Um, we just had elections uh, uh, about three days ago, and actually the, the, the current president, who is a good friend of ours, uh, he, he has been 20 years a business partner of my father-in-law, 
uh, his past was in the agro-industrial. Um, so, for example, to give you an idea of what we are doing in uh, what we call social uh, and impact investing, we've been uh, acquiring, we are the largest landowners uh, after the International Airport of Panama. We've been acquiring all, uh, close to 1,000 acres of land. So we got a zoning logistic industrial, but also agro-industrial, because I, I believe that the, the, the country needs to have better food. Uh, we import most of uh, uh, the food from US, from Mexico, etc. And, uh, and, and Panama is a great logistic hub, you know, it's in the middle of the Americas, uh, and, we have, and we, have, uh, we have good land. So I, when, I, when I went to see the president uh, before elections, I was telling him, I don't see why we cannot bring new technologies. Uh, so we are talking to some companies uh, doing vertical farming, for example. Uh, and, and, and I believe that those technologies needs, can be applied uh, in the region, Central Latin America. Um, uh, so this is one of one of the one of the uh, impact investment we we are currently doing, uh, and uh, I uh, I definitely would love to learn more about the impact from uh, uh, Jim and Justin, uh, as I think that uh, there is also a very interesting case for for our region. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, I'm going to ask all three of you actually. Um, We'll start with you, Justin. What is a specific project? We've heard a lot about your past and your journey to this place. So where you sit today, what is the most exciting project or initiative you're, you are working on that fits within your investment thesis, uh, that directly solves a critical societal issue, while also being innovative, scalable, measurable, all those things that we look, look at as impact investors? Yep. So. I'm going to get greedy and mention two, but I'll keep it brief. <laughs> uh, first, I want to mention um, uh, Jim uh, stated the key point of, about divesting. It's not just divesting the money. It's what you then do with the money that yes. you've divested. So uh, Rock Valley Brothers Fund has been investing in managers whose work aligns with our mission. We're about 99% uh, aligned today in terms of uh, our endowment. So the two I'll mention, so first... Uh, uh, these, you know, bottles of, of, of water are a serious problem in this world, but it's about a $250 billion market, and for 95% of consumption of bottled water, it's actually a rational choice. Uh, we don't necessarily think about that here in Las Vegas, but uh, it's actually a rational choice because the water is too polluted or dirty or unhealthy. And so it becomes critical to have access to water, uh, and there's abundant water in the air, but it's tough to access that water, right, in, in, in humidity. So I've invested in a very cool company called Zero Mass Water, based in Arizona. And they've built units called um, source hydro panels. And these are solar panels, just two, that sit above something that looks a bit like a miniature refrigerator. And they sit on your roof or on your lawn. You can connect them into a long array. And each one is connected to the internet. And the key uh, advance in technology is that the, the um, solar panel powers a fan that brings in air. And then through chemical processes in the unit, you can perfectly uh, clean this water from the air, from the humidity, and then mineralize it and then the solar panel powers a pump that feeds that water down to uh, a drinking station. So this requires no additional infrastructure, and the only inputs are sunlight and air. And out of that, you get about a case of these per day of perfectly pure drinking water. So it's a really exciting technology, and there are many applications uh, providing water to municipalities and... and, uh, and um, you know, agriculture, uh, anyway, the sky's the limit for this company. I look out at all the flat rooftops of the hotels in Las Vegas and just imagine all of these, <laughs> you know, filling perfectly pure drinking water, even in desert air for the, the guests of a hotel. So the, that, that, that's one, zero mass water. And then another is, I mentioned the synergy among several hats that I wear. This group, The Impact, that Jim and I and another of other uh, Impact Investors co-founded is a network of impact investors, typically highly influential families in the places where they live. 
And we do three things. One is education. We publish papers that are all available on our website, theimpact.org, for, uh, for free. Lots of case studies, asset class specific primers, sector specific primers. That's really to build the field of impact investing, uh, to reduce some of the mystery. Uh, and then the second is the network part of it. Think of Young Presidents Organization. Uh, YPO for impact investors. And we bring people together, we build trust, and then uh, they share notes with each other. The third is what happens between those gatherings, which is data-driven insights. And the financial technology company where I work, Adapar, powers the data platform for this network of impact investors so that members in, for example, um, Korea or Chile who are interested in education technology and sustainable agriculture, but only invest locally, can learn about investable opportunities from other members who invested around the world. And that technology-driven transparency de-risks those investments and thus um, facilitates the flow of capital to these businesses, creating measurable social and environmental impact. Okay, I'm going to try and really keep this to one, but it may spill out. I know I've got a, uh, not a lot of time. <laughs> I've been really advocating uh, for impact investing for, you know, over 15 years and participating as an impact investor. And I think there's been uh, some major changes in the last 18 months in really three pieces of legislation that have been passed where the government now is really beginning to adopt policy that motivates uh, impact investing. And there's been a lot of talk about the Opportunity Zone legislation. I won't talk much more about that other than to say that uh, I am in the process of raising a fund to really be focused on double bottom line uh, investing in Opportunity Zones, both uh, a fund for real estate and a fund for, for business. Um, and that uh, fund is Catalyst Opportunity Funds. Uh, the other two pieces of legislation I think are, are also really pretty exciting. Um, CIPRA legislation really focuses on social spending and how we can get uh, more results from uh, the money that we spend for social services by uh, making sure that it's data driven and that it's focused on outcomes. Uh, and I won't get into a lot of detail because it would require more time than we have here, but I think this is a real important trend for getting more for the $1.2 trillion that we spend on, on social programs uh, around the country. Uh, and it engages impact investors. The third really is the BUILD Act. And this is really focused on uh, overseas, uh, OPEC, and enlarges the authority of OPEC to um, become a true development finance uh, corporation by enabling it to be able to invest in invest equity in funds as well as in direct investments alongside grants. And I believe this is a real game changer for um, emerging countries uh, where you can have an organization like OPEC to help really uh, catalyze and bring in impact investment around the world. I think these are really big deals and uh, a big part of my efforts at this point in time are to, um, to shout it out and, and hopefully help make these uh, successful. Sandro? Yes. What does success look like in Panama in 10 years for you as, you know, running your foundation and your family office? Um, you talked a lot about food and water and access. Um, but when we meet back here in 10 years, what does one sentence of success or, or a couple look like for you in Panama? Well, success for me is, uh, is my, my son is going to be born in three months. That, that will be my definition of success or my family. Uh, I, I think that uh, uh, I'm originally Italian and uh, uh, I think the... Uh, doesn't matter uh, what I will do, they will be my, uh, my family will be my success. Uh, in terms of uh, our foundation and our family office, I think we, uh, there is a lot we can do uh, in the region and we, we definitely love to engage other uh, like-minded families. Uh, I, I have the great honor to be on the stage with two uh, today and with you, of course. And, and so the idea is really to find synergies uh, 
uh, I think that there are, uh, it's impossible to solve uh, uh, issues by uh, by ourselves. You know, even uh, even though we we have uh, we, we are uh, we are a prominent family in Panama and in the region, uh, we we need help. So. We think that uh, the key is definitely the cooperation with other families. So there will be uh, another definition of success, uh, uh, really finding uh, uh, good partners uh, globally, I would say, uh, and, uh, and, and find uh, common grounds uh, uh, on different uh, issues which are critical. As I mentioned before, we are very focused on the, obviously on the, on the food, on the agro-industrial, but there is uh, water, as you mentioned, and uh, uh, there is the uh, renewables part also is uh, something we are, uh, we are doing in the region. Uh, and, uh, and I think that, that in, uh, uh, in you have platforms where uh, you can definitely uh, learn from other families and where you can work together. So I'm definitely looking forward to learn more from, uh, from uh, Jim and Justin uh, about the impact. Uh, I know there is a member uh, uh, in the green room, uh, Justin told me there's a member already from Panama, and they're a good friend of ours, so definitely looking forward to, to learn more. Well, that seems like a success to me. So as we conclude this panel with the last couple minutes that we have, um, I think we can all agree that success is growing the impact investing space and continuing to stay committed to field, build, field building, knowledge sharing, connecting other family offices, et cetera. So let's assume everyone in this audience is interested in jumping in and maybe hasn't, hasn't yet. What is one piece of advice you would leave with our audience assuming they're interested in getting involved in impact investing? And just to throw us off a little bit, we'll start with Sandro. Uh, I think uh, I'm not good at giving advices, uh, but I think people is key. Um, for example, here I have uh, you know my chairman of the board, Candice Beaumont, is there. Uh, you know she's been very helpful uh, in uh, in our uh, impact investing. And, uh, uh, and and also working with other families, you know. Um, I saw that Mike uh, was on the other stage, uh, Mike Milken, and I think he's been a great inspiration for us. And uh, uh, really, he's been doing a lot on the philanthropic part, but also on the impact investing. Yeah, oh, very nice. Yeah, I I think really uh, look for opportunities to become engaged, uh, and you don't have to necessarily be uh, an investor if you don't have money. Um, there are many ways that you can become engaged. Uh, in the impact investing movement. And everyone has skills and abilities or connections that they can bring to the space. So if you acknowledge what I consider to be true, which is that what people do with money and more broadly resources has moral consequences, both through acts of omission and, and commission, then the most practical thing you can do is actually just speak to your financial advisor. Um, or your family office uh, in certain circumstances in this crowd, uh, and let them know this is a priority. Because unless they know this is a priority for you, unless you show that this is important to you, you care about how you make money, you care about how you spend money, you care about how you earn money, then you should probably care about how you invest money. If you let them know this is important to you, then you can work with them on engaging and reflecting your portfolio with your values. Thank you, Jim, Justin, Sandra. Thank you so much for coming near and far to join us. Join me in uh, thanking our guests. Thank you so much.